Hey, what's up, everybody? Real Rendezvous crew back with another movie review. I'm Hunter. That's Brett. Man, that kind of rolled off my tongue pretty nicely. No, that was nice. Yeah. Spitting bars. It was, it was smooth. <laughs> what's going on, Brett? Not a whole lot. Sorry I uh, have slept the day away and pretty much the past three weeks. <laughs> been on midnight shift. It sucks. Never take shift work. I like whenever you have the opportunity to take shift work, especially in the evenings and at night, and they're like, "Oh yeah, you're gonna get off shift pay." It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Not worth it. Mm-hmm. Don't do it. Life lesson for all you out there: never take shift work. What's going on, man? Anything specific? Nothing crazy. Um, I've just been, you know, I had to make some resumes last can, night for, some the, resumes? for the first time. Um, in a long time, making a resume can almost be fun. It I, it's so stressful for no reason. Yeah, like it's literally just a piece of paper that lists everything you've done, and for some reason, it's so like nerve wracked because it's like, what do I put on it? Do, I mean, I did this one time. Should that go on there? Yes, just put it. If you don't have, just, just put it on there. You're right. If if you think it makes you look good, put it on. Put there. it on there. But um, pat it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can put some bullshit on there too. Like I was like. County runner up in the spelling bee. Like, did it, you carry it, firewood into the house for your grandma? Well, congratulations, <laughs> you were actually. That was the, de- the the deal breaker right there. Like, man, this guy, you know, showed dedication to his grandma with the firewood. So, well, I was gonna make a joke where you like call it something more professional, but I don't actually know what <laughs> what job description you would give to like someone who carries firewood. Ooh, a lumberjack. <laughs> You're a lumberjack. I were I worked as a, as a lumberjack for a period well, they, of time. <laughs> they cut they cut wood, but I'm sure they have to carry it after cutting it. Always right. <laughs> always use a period of time because then you don't have to specify how long that period is, and you're not <laughs> lying. Yeah, yeah, true, true that, true that. Um, so today we're going to be reviewing the 2010 film Super, directed by James Gunn. Uh, this was Brett's pick. And we're big James Gunn stands. Always have been. For anybody that's followed the podcast, yeah. they know. Shout out James Gunn. Shout out James Gunn. Man, if we ever get good at this, we got to get t-shirts and just say shout, shout out, out James, James Gunn. Gunn. Yeah. Probably be like copyright law. And Profit off of his yeah, name. Yeah, he'd be like, he'd, <laughs> he'll sue he'd us sue for us. defamation. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, we we came away with, uh, mm, I, I think the most popular uh, perspective uh, term that we used earlier was mixed bag. Yeah. Still love James Gunn. Uh, still not a bad movie by any means. Yeah, no. Definitely had redeeming qualities. But, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll save that for the end game here in the mm-hmm. review. Before we dive into it, you want to have some uh, mindless banter here oh, to sure. start off? We have to. What's a real Rendezvous episode without it? Yeah, I got to. Uh, you want to talk a little bit Shorter about Shorter is the answer. <laughs> Shorter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Less time consuming. Um, wouldn't be fun then, though. No. Yeah, at no, least not as fun for us. Oh, opinion. for sure. This is my favorite part. Um, you want to talk about Sonic 2 a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Sonic 2 came out. Uh, I went and saw it. Actually, not even opening day. I saw a special, uh, like, 4 o'clock showing uh, up in at the Cinemark oh, okay. uh, the day before it officially released. So you finally went somewhere other than Tiger. I did. I did. Good job. I did. Proud of you. I had to treat my... Well, for a movie as monumental as Sonic 2, <laughs> yeah. uh, introducing us to Knuckles and Tails and yeah. and all that, um, was and that- it was really good. I liked it a lot. I, I personally have, um, you know, obviously this insane bias for the first movie. The first yeah. movie means a lot to me. Man, I've never seen anybody drag the first Sonic. No, really no. It, it did really well. Um, and so... A lot of my like quote unquote criticisms with Sonic Two kind of aren't fair because mm-hmm. it's just coming from because I how much I love and and hold the first movie in this big regard. Right. It kind of because the the second movie is a better movie, but because of how much better it is, it kind of doesn't like mesh with the first one. I got like you. Sonic Two is definitely the movie they wanted to make and couldn't because they didn't have the budget. And then you. when Sonic One did so well, they were like, "Oh, we can do it now." And so you know, and it, I mean, it is a, a continuation. Obviously, it's like <clears throat> it takes place like very quickly after the first one left off. Let me ask you this: so like. The broadening of the lore and the story and the introduction to more of Sonic's mm-hmm. original characters, a la 
knuckles and mm-hmm. tails that doesn't detract from the movie it does it no no i mean i think i think it all comes th- that's one of the without things, spoiling things yeah no course. spoilers obviously i have yet to see yeah it. um i think that's one of the things that's like it keeps like non at the back of my mind is like because of how low stakes and mm-hmm. how like you know just like smaller scale smaller scale the first one is the second one throws a lot at you very quickly. Right. This movie is whack insane. <laughs> there is not a moment of this movie where whack. something insane is not happening. And it's almost like jarring because of how, you know... It's almost like too much. A little bit. Because the first movie is a road trip buddy comedy. Yeah. M- for the most part. Yeah. And then this movie went full on action adventure. Uh, Ooh. Yeah, no, and it's it's great. It's really Ooh. good, but like it just it kind of adventure because of I've seen the first one so much, and like I just have it. Like I have that that entire first movie. Like I yeah. can watch it with my eyes closed yeah. whenever I want. Yeah, because I've seen it so many times and I love it so much. We know. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the second one kind of felt like weirdly disconnected because of just like how big of a shift there is in scale and you know the characters and just like the style of movie Mm -hmm. it is and that's not a bad thing and i and i kind of am upset with myself for like trying to continually think it's a bad thing because it's not i love the movie it's it's great it's a nine out of ten it's a nine out of ten movie so it's a nine out of ten you're put you're staking your claim i'm staking my claim right now because i don't know when we'll get around to it if ever so i'll stake my claim right now sonic 2 is a nine out of ten but just because I love the first one so much, I feel like I've I've soured it for myself because now I, I have this pedestal and this expectation. And like, you know, objectively, it, Sonic 2 goes above the expectation, but I don't know. I have a really weird relationship with Sonic 2. Really? Yeah, I, I don't know I only watched why. one review for it, Jeremy Johns. Mm-hmm. Shout out Jeremy Johns. And, uh, Shout out y- Jeremy y- Johns. You know, he didn't... He didn't drag it. He didn't say it was a bad movie. It wasn't as good as the first one is basically how I came away from what he said about it. And he kind of said that it had this duality to it Mm -hmm. where there's like a side story with the human characters that they kind of don't need now. Yeah. And that's what, and I, I agree with that to an extent, but like in the opposite direction, I liked the parts where the human characters were there because it Mm -hmm. felt more like the first movie. Ah, I got you. I got you. But, um, you don't want to lose that like quality that the first one had. Yeah, I feel like it could have been more gradual. I got you. I feel like there's a lot of stuff that happens in this movie and is explained in this movie that should have been across two movies. Okay. I feel like a lot of the stuff that happens in this movie could have been saved for a Sonic 3 to bring this one smaller down. Let me ask you this. Also, this movie's um half an hour longer than the first okay. one, and it absolutely does not need to be. Well, well the, There's the, so much they could have Let me cut. ask you this. Speaking of could have been spread out mm-hmm. between another movie. Does it set up for another yes, movie? Yes, it does. I so I, I kind of see why. So it could have extended extended its own life, so to speak. A little bit. I got yeah. you. They, they, they can definitely, and they are franchising it because we, third movie's been green light, mm-hmm. green lit. Green lighted. Knuckles is getting his own show. They're giving Knuckles a, really? an, a show on Paramount Plus. No yeah. way. Yeah. Another reason for me to keep Paramount Plus, yeah. thank God. Well, not another reason. And Knuckles is great. Idris I'm getting Elba, a reason to get rid of Paramount Plus. <laughs> Idris Elba as Knuckles started. is the best part about Sonic 2. He is great. I his, love Idris his, Elba, his, characteriza- his performance is great. Knuckles as a character, his characterization is amazing. The funniest parts of this movie come from Knuckles. Yeah. It's, it's just he is great like what a goaded cast yeah choice. right like, it's insane i i don't remember what knuckles voice sounded like in like the old animated series that i've talked to you about before mm-hmm. like i can remember watching it on like saturday morning for mm-hmm. like wb kids but uh it, it just fits mm-hmm. like yeah having that hard nose grizzled yes like, if your name's knuckles mm-hmm. you gotta sound like a badass yeah and he does he he's great and nobody's voice sounds more badass than idris Elba. yeah no it's 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 really good he does a great job knuckles in the games is is his voice is just very generic like jim bro meathead yeah as opposed to like tribal warrior <laughs> and i think i think the change is great because that's what he is and that's what you told me um whenever we reviewed the original song yes the first song mm-hmm. that uh that opening sequence mm-hmm. that uh tribe group yeah the, those people indigenous yeah. folks that that's what knuckles is from yes that okay. that's his tribe those are you. the echidnas the echidna mm-hmm. okay only complaint about knuckles is that not once do they let him wear his cowboy hat a cowboy hat yeah knuckles he has a cowboy hat yeah and in, in uh sonic 3 
promotional art and then in like knuckles chaotix he's got this big goofy cowboy hat with like a big star on the front of it like he's the sheriff (laughs) and it's amazing and i love it and they didn't they didn't give him to him man not even for like a cool little like easter egg. yeah right i wanted wanted... the first movie had so many dope easter eggs oh this movie still has a ton of great easter eggs knuckles just doesn't get his hat (laughs) jim carrey still crushing it yeah no he's great he's not in it nearly as much that's what you were saying yeah i was i can't talk today Yeah, you're doing great (laughs) what i was saying earlier yeah he's he's definitely takes a bit of a back seat until the final act you know no spoilers but he's knuckles is definitely the focus for 90 percent of the movie speaking of the third act third act is the best part of the movie honest if you just gave me that third act as the movie yeah it that it's perfect really really good time yeah, like I was saying earlier, me and uh, me and Alyssa, I've been working and been sleeping and just haven't had the time to go to the movies. But there's uh, quite a few uh, m- uh, movies out now that I want to see. <laughs> I'm still mad at myself for not making the time to go see the Batman in theaters yeah. the second time. I'd say it's probably still in theaters though, huh? I think it is. Yeah, maybe maybe mm-hmm. I can find it somewhere. I'd like to I'd like to watch it again, but. And I also want to see Sonic, obviously. And uh, what was the other one we were talking about earlier? Uh, everything, everywhere, all at once. Yeah. Everybody is shitting their pants at how good this movie <laughs> yeah. is. Yeah. Um, and me and you both, not saying, you know, we know what we're talking about, mm-hmm. but in case you've been following the pod, we know what the fuck we're talking about here. <laughs> uh, we both called our shot and said that movie looked great. Yeah. First trailer. I love the trailers. Yeah. yeah. So those guys, the Daniels, also directed a movie that came out like five or six years ago called Swiss Army Man. Have you yeah, heard of that? Yeah, I, I haven't seen it, but I, I know what it's about. I think Daniel was, Radcliffe is in, is in it. Yeah, you know who else is in it? Hmm. Uh, Paul Dano. Yeah, he is. He's yeah. the guy that is using... He's the Swiss Army Man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna have to check that out. I've never. I've never yeah. seen it. I, yeah, I, I remember. I wanted to always check it out. And I just never got around to it. It looked kind of like a really like bonkers. I, I don't know, unique like comedy, but it looked like it had heart. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. know how to describe it. I think it. I think it's a dramedy. Is it, it, it looked is. very unique to me mm-hmm. though, and and this movie, everything everywhere yeah. all at once, looks super unique. Yeah, and uh, you know we were just talking about how. Uh, the actor uh, Kei Hui Kwan, Kei Hu Kwan, pardon uh, my awful butchering of his name if I am, but um, this is like him coming back to cinema because he played as Data on the Goonies and Short Round from Temple of Doom, and you know those are two movies that are just like iconic from the eighties. Mm-hmm. You know, big time adventure cinema, and he hadn't he'd been out of acting for a long time. And I was just excited to see him in that role. Plus, I really get the vibe that this movie is low key, kind of like a kung fu film. Yeah. In some aspects. And I love me some martial arts. So I'm really interested in seeing that. But you've watched the the newest episode of Moon Knight? Yes. Speaking of adventures. Yeah. Is there globe trotting? There is globe trotting. Okay. That's what I love. Did was Moon Knight Moon Knight had its first first episode last time we recorded didn't it or was it not did we out dis- yet did we discuss the second episode last time we recorded i don't know if it was out i don't think it was yeah i don't think it was so we both have watched the second episode mm-hmm. i have not watched the third okay <laughs> you gotta keep up with the premieres man every wednesday <laughs> I know. every wednesday you got a, a lot time dude, for so moon like, night dude so like day before yesterday i sat on my couch turned on my tv got my hub of all my apps ready to watch my cat jumps on my lap because she wants attention mm-hmm I'm petting her. Next thing I know, I wake up. My cat's gone. The remote's still in my hand. Apps are still pulled up. <laughs> and it's like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And I was like, well, I better just go to bed. So I Gotcha. That, once again, that rotational shift work. Don't do it. <laughs> It'll do bad things to you. You won't get to watch Moon Knight premiere every Wednesday. I, fell, I guess I fell asleep uh, last night watching TikTok. And I guess it just never went off. Because mom came in this morning to wake me up. Before she left for work. It yeah. was like seven in the morning. Yeah. She thought I was awake because I was, you know, I was laying face in the wall. So she couldn't see my face and I was holding my phone and just videos were playing. <laughs> and she thought I was up and she woke me up and she was like, what? I thought you were awake. You're watching videos. I went, what? what? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Good thing it wasn't any kind of video that would uh, get you in the jailhouse. Oh, geez. 
<laughs> yeah, right before bed. Yeah. This is why I just I throw it on for sleep noise. Yeah, it's, it's like <laughs> instead of like ocean waves, <laughs> yeah. like just graphic like sex, drugs, <laughs> alcohol. Um, speaking of graphic sex, drugs, and alcohol, how about that movie Super? Huh? How about Super three? All three parental guidelines yeah. severe. Yeah, like I think it was like five on on IMDb. It has like a section that shows like what the parental guidance would be suggested for this film, and like it's got like five categories. One's like nudity, violence, uh, language. And then uh, I can't remember what the other two are, but like Brett said, all all uh, all five of them were severe. <laughs> yeah, they were red, and then said severe next to them, and they ain't lying. <laughs> that, that, that there's no exaggeration whatsoever on these being severe and over the top, uh, to a fault, we'll say. Mm-hmm. Um, but with that said, I mean, is there anything else you want to touch base on, or do you want to go ahead and get all up in super? We'll jump into it. Two things I want to preface okay. before we jump into it. I'm going to get it out of the way. As we've just discussed with like the severe uh, content of this film, there's a scene in particular, and I'll, I'll, let, I'll let us know when we get to it, but quick content warning. There's a scene in this movie that we are going to discuss that has to deal with sexual assault uh, against one of the main characters. So if that's not something you're comfortable with hearing about, uh, in this episode, I will, uh, I, you know, like I said, we will announce when we get to that scene, and then you can, you know, sort of skip through, and then we'll announce when we're done talking about it, so you can find the part where, you know, it's safe listening again, but I just wanted to get that out of the way. Second thing, uh, just to avoid any confusion, um, this movie came out in 2011, and it has the actor Elliot Page in it, and since this movie has come out, Elliot Page has come out as a trans man. He uses he, him pronouns. In this movie, this movie came out pre-transition. So right. his character in this movie is named Libby, and she is portrayed as a female. So we're going to do our best uh, when we are talking about the character of Libby, like the character. The yeah. pronouns used are going to be she and her, and if we have to talk about the actor and his performance, you know, we'll switch it over accordingly. I just don't want anyone to think that we're being insensitive or trying to purposely misgender uh, Elliot Page. But in this movie, the character of Libby is a female. So I'm- that... That's I'm, what we're I'm, talking I'm about. I'm glad you, you brought both those up. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I, had to, I was thinking about it. I was like, when, when, I, when should I put in those disclaimers? I'm putting them in right now. Well, and just a disclaimer, too, also with the character Libby. If we say anything negative, it has absolutely nothing to do with Elliot Page's performance. Yeah. Because uh, everything else I've seen Elliot Page in, he's yeah. a pretty badass actor. Yeah. But, uh, and the, even in this, his performance is great. Yeah. I just His character is awful. Yeah. Um, which we'll get to that here in a minute. But, uh, with that said, um, I'll get into the synopsis here. Now it says 2010 on here. Yeah. But on the TV. It said 2011. 2011. And then when I Googled it, it said it came out April 1st of 2011. Ah. We might have a summer, 500 days of summer on our hand where it like premiered at a festival first and then came out. That's probably what happened because this was promoted and distributed by IFC Films, Mm -hmm. which is like independent film company or something like that so this is one of those like indie film like eh, what's the word i'm looking for here it was an indie film basically okay so yeah that's probably what happened i think the theatrical release was april 1st 2001 which is hilarious and i think maybe it came out on something 500 days of summer could probably be considered an indie film too i would 100 percent. well it was not only mark webb's first theatrical film it was you know you can just tell i don't think it had like a huge wide release or anything either which mm-hmm. i don't believe this one did did brick have a wide release no okay no it didn't. man we, we we love ourselves some underground cinema here we're we're all over the place buddy we cover all grounds hey, here at the real rendezvous that's why more more people should listen to us for real um spe- your friends speaking of um not having a wide release i guess i should have brought up here a little bit of the background um, the budget for this movie was two and a half million, and this thing didn't make shit, dude. Yeah. Uh, U.S. gross was three hundred twenty-seven thousand, and the worldwide gross was only four hundred twenty-two thousand. So didn't make a whole lot of money. But then again, like we said, I know for a fact this movie did not have a wide release. Yeah. Um, I can remember when it came out, and the first time I ever saw that it was even out was just on TV. I don't remember it ever being like in theaters around here or anything. So 
damn, I wrote score soundtrack and didn't write the guy's name. That's okay, though, because I know who did the score. Yeah. <laughs> my man, Tyler Bates. I was telling Brett earlier, um, he's one of my favorite uh, like musical composers and soundtrack guys for movies. He used to be Marilyn Manson's touring guitarist. And like, I love heavy metal music and, and, you know, rock and shit. And you can see a lot of that in any James Gunn movie, but also in other movies that Tyler Bates does the score and soundtrack for, you can see it. Um, he did like the John Wick movies. He also did Deadpool two. Um, which I think also Deadpool two has like a very similar, like comical soundtrack almost like, uh, what was the song about the juggernaut in Deadpool 2? Yeah. Like, it, it, he just got, like, funny, like, scores. Yeah. And then also in this movie, like, the score has that, like, kind of, like, la, 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 mm-hmm. la. Like, um, yeah, but I, I really love Tyler Bates. Uh, stars Rain Wilson in the lead role as Frank Darbo. Uh, also stars Liv Tyler, Elliot Page, Kevin Bacon, Michael Rooker, Sean Gunn and Nathan Fillion. And this is, you know, the typical James Gunn roster <laughs> yeah. of uh cast and crew. Um I think everybody like really like just does a good job in all the roles for the most part. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I guess I should just wait till the end of the review, but I just I had no like redeeming dialogue coming away from this film. Anyways, let's, let's just, we'll go ahead and get into the synopsis here. Sorry. I stumbled around there for a minute. I meant, I meant to read the, you know, director and the cast and crew and stuff prior to, I forgot. Um, so anyways, we'll jump into the synopsis for super 2011 directed by James Gunn and written. He wrote it and written. Mm Mm-hmm. And you were saying he writes a lot of stuff. He writes a lot of stuff. If you look up James Gunn's like catalog filmography, yeah, uh, most of it is not even stuff he directed. Most of it's stuff he's either produced or wrote. Yeah, you blew my mind earlier when you told me he wrote the first two, the two Scooby Doo yeah. movies. Well, people refer to them as James Gunn's Scooby Doo movies. That's why I thought he directed them, mm. and then we we went further into it, and he actually wrote the screenplay. I want to say Roland Emmerich directed the first Scooby Doo movie. I don't know if he did the second one. Which Roland Emmerich did like a bunch of like big, loud, goofy, like late 90s uh, action movies like Independence Day and the God, like 1998 Godzilla. I don't know if you've ever seen that or heard of that, but it wasn't particularly good. Are you looking it up now? The, sorry, you said the 20, which, which Godzilla? Not the 2010, in like 98 or something like that. Roland Emmerich. Oh, okay. Well, the guy, I thought maybe James Gunn did the second one, but he didn't. Raja Gonsal did the oh, second one. Oh, Raja Gosnell. Damn. I think he did the first one, too. I thought it was Roland Emmerich. Man, good thing this isn't open trivia. Okay, yeah, no, he did both. Raja, Raja Gosnell. He's, go. he's done some other stuff. Well, let's not get all about Raja Gosnell here. <laughs> anyway, super. So... Frank Darbo, played by Rain Wilson, is a meek fry cook at a diner who has had two perfect moments in his entire life, marriage and assisting the police to apprehend a criminal. Now his marriage to Sarah is beginning to fall to pieces. He meets Jock, a stoner and a friend of Sarah who later runs off with her. Frank tries to get Jock arrested, but Detective John Felkner won't do it and tells Frank to find someone else to love. She's obviously just ran away with the guy. Mm -hmm. He did not kidnap her or anything. Um, While watching TV, browsing through his TV, he finds a Christian-themed program, and Frank is impressed by a costume hero, the Holy Avenger, played by Nathan Fillion, who represents the will of Jesus Christ. Frank tries to confront Jacques, but is beaten up by his henchmen. Then later, Frank is visited by the Holy Avenger in a dream sequence and (laughs) decides to become a superhero. All right, so we'll stop right there. I'm a big fan of them glossing over. (laughs) I like it. Let's fill in the blanks here. Um, so opening in the movie, uh, whenever he first talks about the, his two perfect moments in his life, I thought that was a pretty cute way to yeah. just d- open up who the character was. Mm-hmm. And you can tell, well, this is why this guy wants to be a superhero. Yeah. He holds this moment of telling that cop, mm-hmm. there he goes Yeah, in such high regard in his life. So I thought that was cool. And plus, 
I love that animated opening mm-hmm. like credits to you. Oh, once. it's fantastic. It looks really good. It looks like a bunch of like little kids drew mm-hmm. it. Um, also, uh, you can tell that when he meets the character of Jacques played by Kevin Bacon, like Jacques is more, it's, it just describes him as a stoner here. But he, this guy is obviously more than just yeah. a stoner. This yeah, guy's kind of yeah. like a big baller drug mm-hmm. dealer type. Um, and Kevin Bacon, I think, does a really good job of yeah. just being like a scummy, like yeah. Douche. He shows up to Frank's house looking for Frank's wife to take her away and and go yeah. do stuff, and and she's not home, and so he invites himself in to eat breakfast with Frank. Yeah, and like Frank just folds like a lawn chair. Yeah, you know, because Frank's just this, you know, he's this socially awkward. As it says, meek. Meek. Yeah, that's a good word for good, it. Good way to describe Frank. And right off the bat, I loved. I've never seen Rain Wilson in anything else other than The Office. Right. And I don't even watch The Office. I've never seen a full episode of The Office. <laughs> Me either. I just, you, but you look at, you know, you know he's Dwight Schrute. I don't even know what else he's in, to be honest. I think he actually plays in Rob Zombie's House of a Thousand Corpses. Oh, yeah. Which came out a few years before this, which is funny because, so I, like, I wonder if Rob Zombie and James Gunn are Our boys, pals, yeah. Like, because Rob Zombie's always doing voices in, mm-hmm. like, his movies. Uh, Rob Zombie does the voice of God in this movie, <laughs> yeah. which is awesome. But uh, so also in that sequence where he's watching TV and stumbles upon this Christian theme program, while he's like scanning through channels, there's like hentai on one of the channels. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't which know. Which I just thought was really abrasive. What what network? I, mean, I thought it was funny, but what yeah, network what, television yeah. channel in this guy's town is like. Bo- even if you got Showtime or HBO yeah. Max, you ain't gonna see nothing like that. No, but. dude, and and like, <laughs> we, it cannot be understated. We're like, <laughs> calling it hentai is not an over exaggeration. It's legit. It just was. <laughs> there's, d- d- yeah. The tentacles, it's all there. Mm-hmm. Maybe um, that's maybe that's why he imagined. That's exactly the, why he imagined. Okay, it. and I thought that was kind of funny that he was like, "Well, you know, I, I've since I was young, I've had these visions." And so, like <laughs> off and on throughout the film, Frank kind of narrates it, and he he stakes claim to having these visions. And in this moment, uh, he has a vision where God comes and touches him and tells him uh, that this is what he needs to do. He needs to take Sarah back. But prior to like what he sees as God touching him mm-hmm. is all these freaking tentacles come yeah. out of the wall and grab him and slice his brain open. James Gunn still had Slither on the mind when he was <laughs> filming that yeah, scene. Yeah, that's exactly what I... It had also it was like the two like pointy tentacles yeah. that like, stab you. And I was just like... And then one of them comes in and squeezes barbecue sauce onto his brain <laughs> and then another one rolls a yeah, corn what, dog around in it. I don't know what fuck? that was for. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what that had to do with anything. You know, and like I kind of like laughed, but it was almost like a pity laugh. Yeah, like, like what is happening? <laughs> like didn't need that. And then nothing even remotely similar to that happens for the rest of the movie. And and, and like I like off the wall comedic stuff like that, mm-hmm. but I just felt like it was a little too jarring. Yeah, I, I don't know. I will say I got a really big laugh out of when he's in the void. And then he turns around, and it's just like a completely flat PNG of his logo, yeah, just floating next to him, yeah. Like no shading, it, like it barely, <laughs> like it looks like they just pasted it on there, and it's it, it looks really funny to me, <laughs> in a good way, not like oh that, that looks so bad. Like I think it was supposed to look goofy like that. Yeah, when he's like in the void, it's just like all like white. Yeah, and like he he's just, at Heaven's Gate, and he just turns around, and his logo's just <laughs> in the void. So at this moment, whenever he. Uh, tell he can tell that this is what he needs to do he needs to become a superhero um oh just to back up just a little bit to the christian theme program that he watches the holy avenger Mm -hmm. it's that shit is funny yeah with nathan fillion with like the goofy wig that's really funny and then so like in this program this christian theme program of the holy avenger like the devil is portrayed by james gunn Mm -hmm. himself and he's like constantly like flicking his tongue, yeah, always, and being just like goofy and creepy, and it's really funny. What's, that I found that stuff the funniest segments of the whole movie. There was a really funny bit. I think it was during the him watching the show where like they're like Jesus on your wall, <laughs> and like Jesus is sitting on this guy's yeah. wall, and he wakes up in bed, and he's like. Don't make a big deal out of it, bro. It's yeah. really no big deal. Yeah, he's just sitting there hanging. <laughs> like I, I don't. That was that was really funny to me. Um. So. After this, he goes to the local comic book store and begins shopping to do some research. There, he meets Libby, played by Elliot Page, 
a clerk at the comic book store who recognized him from a diner from the diner where he works at. She says she always has lunch there. Mm-hmm. He is inspired by the comic book, the comic books he buys, and becomes the Crimson Bolt. His first outing is a total failure, and Frank goes back to the comic book store for inspiration, buying several comics on superheroes who have no real powers. After selecting a wrench for his weapon, he begins his assault on crime. So, whenever we see him make his suit, I think both of us were low-key kind of like, Yeah. Suit's not bad. Yeah, they were going, I you can obviously tell they were going for like a goofy, handmade, like not cool suit. But like, honestly, it's kind of a cool suit. I think like when you can see like really like shoddy mm-hmm. stitch work i like that i, I think I, it looks cool my favorite part of it is the mask i think the mask is really cool i like his like random like little placements of like shoulder pad. yeah he's got like a cod piece mm-hmm. like it, it's kind of funny but it kind of looks cool like yeah. it especially looks really cool I and mean, we'll you, get there but like, I, you know what it kind of reminds me of a little bit hmm. like obviously in a way smaller scale version of it like a shittier version of it but um in peacemaker vigilante's costume oh yeah because like we're always like where did vigilante get that dope costume yeah but really when you think of it there's not a whole lot to vigilante's costume mm-hmm. either it's it's basically just a bulletproof vest yeah and, a, and like yeah. A, a mask with a visor like and then just tactical belts and whoever does the costume design for these two movies we need to get a hold of them yeah see what they can do for us yeah. what kind of what kind of budget they need but uh, And then him getting his pipe wrench is hilarious, too. Yeah. So the sequence where he decides on a pipe wrench uh, being his weapon of choice shows him take, like, a melon. He buys, like, a honeydew from the mm-hmm. grocery store and draws a little smiley face on it. And he just smashes it with a pipe wrench and says, that'll do. <laughs> yeah. Which, is, I mean, it's practical. Um. So... He begins his assault on crime, and we get like a big montage of him just beating the shit out of people yeah. with his pipe wrench. And then every time he does it, he he yells what crime they did to them, and he says, don't do it. Yeah, yeah. And, and like, I think it's really kind of like, this is another part in the movie that just feels disjointed to me, because there's a scene that has like a guy that's about to like molest a kid, mm-hmm. and like he stops him yeah. and beats the hell out of the dude, rightfully so, but like... I I get that this is like a dark comedy, but it's almost like it's too dark for me. Like, I don't want to, like, it, it lumps that in with a dude peddling some, like, shitty weed to a couple, yeah. like, bros. <laughs> like, and, it, it, it definitely makes a leap there. Yeah, yeah, and I think you've pointed that out, like, when me and you were talking about it upstairs. There's a couple moments in this movie, you know, that we're going to talk about later, too, that is just, like, kind of, like... It's like, whoa, where did that come from? Super, <laughs> super James Gunny. Like he, he'll just go there. Like, yeah, you can definitely tell that there was no one creatively on this movie but him yeah. to tell him, hey, maybe, maybe we shouldn't do that. You didn't have the big fingers involved mm-hmm. uh, of like, you know. And I would say if that this was made by maybe, a big production yeah, company, and I would say that maybe, maybe his things are better when there's a little bit of somebody restraint there to pull back the yeah, reins, hold them in. Yeah, like even with Slither. Like, yeah, it's really graphically violent, but it knows what it is. Mm -hmm. Like, it knows it's mostly just like a horror movie with some comedy in it. And you can't even call it black comedy because we just have horror comedies anyway. Mm -hmm. Like, this movie struggles, and I think this is my biggest flaw with the film overall, is it just struggles to have a true identity. And it does a lot of things, like, nice, but I just think it would be better if it knew how to rear its head in one direction, for the most part. But uh, anyways, so Frank's still in love with Sarah. He continues to watch over her as henchman Abe, played by Michael Rooker, drives her to a mansion. His co-worker Hamilton asks him to save a place in line for a movie, and Frank has an altercation with another patron who butts in, <laughs> butts into the line, skips line, uh, and he ends up sending this guy and his girlfriend to an IC, to the ICU after like, beating them up. Yeah, I didn't like that part either because up until this point in the movie, you know, Frank, you know, obviously he's a little unhinged because he's, you know, but he's kind of justified yeah, for what he's doing. He's still doing good things. <laughs> you should not beat the hell out of somebody. Yeah. You should not send them to ICU for skipping yeah. line. Yeah, that 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 part was like I don't know. Like, because up until that point, I'm rooting for Frank. I yeah. like Frank as a character. And then that part comes up. It's like, that was a little much, dude. <laughs> like, what? Yeah. And like you said, he's obviously got like uh, social issues, mm-hmm. like with just interacting and stuff. But like, 
it was a little much. Um, so fearing he's going to get sent to prison, Frank discards his costume, but after watching another episode of the Holy Avenger, goes and gets it back. I thought that was kind of a I funny love scene. Nathan Fillion's like little smirk into the camera after he says it. I I thought that was like a really funny scene mm-hmm. where the detective was like knocking on Frank's door <laughs> yeah. and like it shows yeah, it like shows the his outline. train of thought of what he thinks is gonna happen. It shows him getting shot, arrested, and then getting raped in prison. <laughs> yeah, which is really graphic, but like I thought it was funny. And then like he does such a poor job of like lying <laughs> he didn't even need to lie like yeah. he just didn't even need to acknowledge anything yeah he's looking at the closet the whole time and the detective points out he's like is there something there's something in there he's like no there's nothing in there and the detective's gonna take it at that and he's like oh okay and then like while the detective is trying to drop it he's like it's a dog there's a dog in the closet <laughs> yeah <laughs> like he just keeps making it worse for himself um and the detective wasn't even there about the crimson bolt he had just nothing to, to do with yeah, it had nothing to do with it um, so after he gets his costume back, Frank stakes out at the mansion that he saw Abe taking Sarah to earlier. He sees Quill, one of Jock's other, uh, henchmen, his little goonie, and Toby, another henchman goonie, played by Sean Gunn. I was going to say, is Quill or Toby Sean? Toby is, uh, Sean Gunn's, or, uh, James Gunn's brother, Sean. Uh, they're in there doing drugs with Sarah. I don't think I remember anybody doing drugs except Sarah. No, they were they were testing their supply on her. That's right. Yeah. That's right. They uh, were testing their chain of uh, heroin in the foot too. I don't. Maybe that's a thing. Well, maybe I'm not integrated so, enough to know that that's how that works. So people that do heroin, you know, obviously they usually just do where yeah. they find the vein in the arm. When people are hooked on heroin, like it just begins to like destroy their arm and their vein mm-hmm. to where they can't shoot up there anymore, and plus. It's just more visible. People can yeah. see your wounds from where you've been shooting up. So they'll do it between their fingers, between their toes, just in spots that are hard to see, which I have like a thing about needles yeah. that I can't stand. And like I had to like not, like I had to look away from that scene at, where they're. At, at first, when they had the needle like near her foot, I thought they were going to kill her <laughs> because <laughs> there's a, well, there's, um, I don't know if this is true or not. Brett's so innocent. But there's a post where if you, if you shoot air, in between someone's toes, it stops their heart. And then when doctors do autopsies, it looks like a heart attack. Really? And so I thought they were trying to like discreetly kill her. And that was going to be where that scene went. If I ever need to, to get rid of somebody, <laughs> Brett, you're my guy. Yeah, I guess if you shoot, like, I don't know how compressed it has to be or if you just fill a tube with Ugh. just regular air. But I guess if you shoot air through a needle in between someone's toes, it stops their heart. I don't know if that's true, but it, it's like a post I've seen somewhere. Man, you might need to edit this out in case you know, somebody you know, somebody close to you ends up dying of a mysterious heart attack Uh-oh. sometime soon. Um, but yeah, it, so heroin, that's... Yeah, foot heroin was not something I was aware of going into the movie. You're so innocent. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of why people shoot heroin. Yeah, I don't really hang out with the stuff. heroin crowd. <laughs> well, I don't either. I just, I just have, tell you the truth, I don't know where I've seen that at. But, um, oh man, I just hate needles. That grosses yeah, no, me out. It, I, I was more okay with it because I didn't directly see it like go into a vein. Yeah. But I, I cannot stand things that have to do with just veins in general. I had to look away. Oh, I hate it. Like, I can remember one time I had uh, poison ivy real bad. Mm-hmm. And so if you go to the doctor for poison ivy, they want to give you a steroid shot. That steroid shot is a needle like this fucking big. Oh. goes in like your butt cheek. And so I got a shot there. And it's like I could feel... Mm-hmm. Like the fluid injecting into my... That's the worst. Ugh. That's awful. Ugh, that sensation was like, I, I about fell on the floor and passed When I out. went to the dentist the other day, they had to numb my mouth because mm-hmm. they were doing fillings. Mm-hmm. And those those were really big needles. Yeah. I, just, I hate when I can feel that there is something in my skin. Mm. That's my least favorite part about it. Uh, we need to move on. I'm yeah, let's, let's, let's get away from the needles. I'm feeling faint. <laughs> oh. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, thud. You just hear a thud <laughs> yeah. on my mic. <laughs> and then you edit it out. Yeah, we're back. <laughs> yeah. We got Hunter a glass of water. Um, so Frank stakes out of the mansion, sees him uh, shooting up. Jock kisses her, and the Crimson Bolt gets angry and ends up smashing the window out. The henchmen pull out guns and start shooting at Frank. Uh, Frank flees the scene, and he ends up getting shot in the leg uh, in his escape. Frank goes to Libby's apartment where she's hosting a party and reveals his identity to her. Libby is very excited and impressed, and she treats his wound. 
She offers to become his sidekick and auditions a costume and several sidekick names, finally setting on settling on Bolty. Which wasn't even on her list. <laughs> her list was ridiculous. And her I, costume's funny, too, because... Excuse me. It does not match. Yeah, she, his went, for, color she went for Sprite. <laughs> I thought Crimson Kid was a was a good name, though. That reminds like me. Like if I was the Crimson Bolt and I was choosing a sidekick name, Crimson Kid was a, was a Crim- good choice. Crimson Kid makes me think of the Crimson Shin. The Creeping Bam. What's a Creeping Bam? Yeah, she's like, what's, what's a-, a Toro? <laughs> she has a good point. And then she asks, what's a Robin? It's, it's a bird. It's like, why is he called Robin? I think I think Toro because he's loyal. I think Toro is Spanish for bull. Maybe I'm not sure. I think it is. I, I'm not sure. Though. That's why they say it. Yeah, don't quote me on that. Because they're like calling the bull. Like, yeah. That's where Toro Toro comes from. Toro. They're just like bull. <laughs> bull, come here. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it's true. That's what you're right. That's what it is. It's like I think gato is Spanish for cat. cat. So yep. like gato gato, like cat, come here, hex. Yeah. Cat, come here. Yeah. My cat's name sucks. Just Word of the day. Is. Toro. Means <laughs> bull. Um, but anyways, let's back up here for a second. Um, whenever the henchmen pull out their guns and start like shooting at Frank, I thought that was really funny. And that was whenever he realized, like, oh shit, like I'm screwing with the wrong people here. Cause he smashes the window and uh he has like a really funny line. What's he say? He's like uh Face the wrath yeah, of the says, Crimson Bolt. Face the wrath of the Crimson Bolt. And then they just both pull out their, yeah. their gats. He and he's runs. like, oh, man. Um, and then when he goes to Libby's apartment, after he's been shot, like he doesn't change out of his yeah, costume or anything. he just comes it up with trash bags. He just takes a bunch of trash bags and puts them over top of himself. And then after she chases off all of her like normie friends and starts like trying to treat his wound, she obviously has yeah, no idea so bad at what it. she's doing. And I just think it's funny it was never addressed in the film later. Like, if you don't treat like a bullet wound properly, like you end up like having to like get your leg amputated. Like it'll get if that shit gets infected, like you're gonna die. Yeah. For the record, the way they treated his it was it was a clean through bullet wound. The way they treated it was Libby poured half a bottle (laughs) of isopropyl alcohol directly into it. He screamed. They wrapped it with a bandage. And then they went home. Yeah, and then my man, my man <laughs> was, was good to go. And then he was fine. It was like almost as ridiculous as like Resident Evil Eight, like healing ointment. Yeah. Like, or not healing ointment, but the he's on that Ethan grind. Yeah, yeah. You remember when Ethan gets his whole goddamn hand cut <laughs> off and he just pours, <laughs> pours the, the, the stuff, stuff on, on it, it and it. sticks his own hand now, back on? Now, granted, minor spoilers. That's a him specific issue, though. <laughs> no Very one true. else. The juice doesn't work like that for anyone but him. Very true. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. No, no spoilers there, but you're right about that. Anyways, I love Resident Evil 8. I got to replay it. Anyways. Uh, I want to replay 7. 7 was really good. Seven's too scary for me. <laughs> I beat it once. That was it. Resident Evil 8, I think, finds that perfect balance mm-hmm. of scary, but still. Resident Evil is 100% an action game as opposed to what 7 was. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure, Resident Evil 8. I mean, you can unlock a lightsaber as a weapon. Resident Evil 8 is definitely an action game. But I will argue that Resident Evil 8 has one of... has Like, Resident Evil 7 is the scarier game as a whole, but Resident Evil 8, the scariest segment oh, in the game, is God. way scarier than anything in yeah. Re- Resident Evil 7. Yeah, they definitely pulled out all the stops for that one. What What is, what is that... What is that house is called? The, it's like an Italian name. Yeah, it is. Oh, it starts with the B, I think. Benevenito. Yes, Benevento that's it. That's exactly what it it's is. It's House Bene, Beneviento, yep. I think. Damn, that shit's like just so scary. My slipper fell off. I got the dogs out right now. You're over there creaking. <laughs> just <laughs> get my, it back. To fix my slipper. <laughs> All right, anyways. So back to Super. Not Resident Evil. <laughs> um,. I lost where I was. We need to get Alyssa down here to just snap at us. Oh, <laughs> we need yeah. start talking about other stuff. Focus. Um, so after they treat his wound, uh, she ends up coming out with her costume and decides on the nickname Balti. Uh, Frank is totally against this. He says he doesn't need a sidekick, but she just is very persistent and basically makes it happen. Um, about this time, Detective Felkner figures out Frank's identity and goes to his house to search. As he's exiting the closet at uh, Frank's house, Abe and the other henchmen are there and shoot him dead, mistaking him for Frank. 
And as soon as he falls over and is dead, they're like, yeah. that's not Frank. <laughs> then why did you shoot? I shot because you shot, man. Yeah, that was funny. They're all like bumbling idiots. Um, the next day, Crimson Bolt and Boldy wait for wait for more crime. Boldy convinces him to assault a guy who keyed a car of one of her friends, but she gets very carried away, and the Crimson Bolt has to stop her from killing him. Later at a gas station, the henchmen catch up with Frank and chase him off. They pull out guns, but Boldy ends up running one of them over uh, with a car. Well, not running him over, but pinning him against the wall. Dude, that's got to suck. And then Crimson Bolt uh, steals one of the henchmen's guns and shoots him. And then gets a hold of Boldy, drags her into the car, who's raving psychotically, and escapes. Yeah, Boldy has a switch when she puts on that costume. And it's really, really weird, too, because her character is totally, like, she's, like, totally likable and, yeah, like, normal. Yeah, so, I thought she was so cool. <laughs> Even whenever she, like, gets, like, the Boldy costume and stuff on she's still funny yeah but like you said it's almost like when they go to that guy's house that she says keyed one of her friend's cars she becomes a completely different character yeah and it almost like is like this juxtaposition that they're trying to put together with her and frank like where frank is like no we can't do this Mm -hmm. but frank's also a little over the top too so that kind of like, like I was saying earlier, it's like there's no character yeah. I truly like. Like, I just can't even get behind Frank either. Yeah, and, and that that's what I was saying about the scene with the line. Like, that was like, it's like, now, Frank, I was with you <laughs> until you just did that. So, uh, this next segment here shows them. Um, hold on a second. Oh, man, I got to do a better job of keeping track here. Uh, Once they return back to his house, Libby makes a pass at Frank, but he declines, stating he is a married man. Later the next day, they go shopping for weapons and train at a gun range. The media starts to defend the Crimson Bolt and Boldy, and Libby becomes ecstatic about this, seeing herself on a TV news article and showing both of them as potential heroes. Um... I will say that this next segment I'm going to read Mm -hmm. is the trigger warning. Yeah, this right here, this is the, you might want to skip over this part. Yeah. For, you know, the disclaimer we gave before we started talking about the synopsis. We're here. We we made it. I would, I would. This is the one. I would give it like a solid uh, three minutes. uh, Skip over this. Yeah. Um, So anyways, uh, continuing on. After seeing them both uh, being shed in the limelight as potential heroes, Libby starts to develop feelings for Frank. She ends up waking him up in the evening while they're asleep and dances very suggestively for him while in costume, culminating with her pulling his mask over his head and raping him. While puking in the toilet afterwards, Frank sees Sarah's image and vows to go rescue her. And I'm just going to very quickly make one statement here. This is probably both of our least favorite parts of the movie. It, it is the worst part of the movie. Talking about things being jarring and disjointed. So weird. Didn't have to happen. Did not have to happen at all. Libby's character was already being ruined. It adds nothing to the movie whatsoever. Right. And also, <laughs> whenever it, this happens, immediately after he goes to the bathroom and pukes in the toilet, and he sees the image of Sarah in his vomit, and yeah. it's almost like it starts to transition once again. Tries to transition something, and it like motivates him to- extremely serious <laughs> yeah. to like supposed to be funny. And yeah. I know this is a black comedy, and you can say what you will. Like it's that's what it's supposed to be, Hunter. You're supposed to find humor in something that's more serious, which I can find humor in a lot of serious yeah, stuff. Yeah, but like this they don't even try me. and pl- like there is nothing about it that tries to play it as a joke. Yeah, she literally it is. You literally just watch. It comes for, for like three or two minutes of just Libby raping Frank. Yeah. And it comes off in a serious tone, too. Yeah, no. That you don't want to watch. Like, it would be like a serious, like, drama film yeah. about sexual assault. Yeah. And you would, I would come away with the same sensation, which, once again, I think that's something that no director can really tackle. Mm-hmm. How do you make that, that topic, that subject matter, something that you can portray in yeah. a comedic way and 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 it strikes it as even stranger to me like what i was saying about how it it adds nothing because it's never brought up again like because very quickly after that you know we'll get to what happens but like even earlier like i said whenever he envisions himself getting raped in prison i said i laughed some but 
it's almost like a pity laugh. Yeah, like, it's I like okay, can't really find humor. In Jeez. It. Um. So, anyways, um, after he sees the image of Sarah, he vows to rescue her. Jock is hosting a drug buyer at his mansion. The guy's name is Mister Range, and Jock gives Sarah to him so he can. Oh wait, hold on, sorry. At this moment, we are done talking about the um. If you if you if you were skipping through to find us saying we're done, we we have concluded our our discussion about the scene, and now we're back on track for the the rest of the regular synopsis. Way to jump back in there, buddy. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, nope, you're good. Because I, I remember I told them to look. Listen, we were going to announce that it was over, so they could look for us talking about how it was done. Um, that you're good. Good job. This is a a new horizon for yeah. us, and you covered it well. Um. So anyways, Sarah ends up uh, getting taken upstairs with Mr. Range. Uh, He's presumably wanting to try and seduce her, have his way with her. And she's still drugged out of her mind on this heroin, doesn't really know what's going on. Um, So Crimson Bolt and Boldy show up on the scene and storm the mansion, killing all the guards outside until Boldy is brutally killed in the shootout. Bolt breaks in and kills the other henchmen, the final ones being Quill and Abe. And then after a discussion with Jock, but in the deception, he shoots the Crimson Bolt, tormenting him, saying that they're far more alike than he would ever want to admit. Um, After they have a little bit more of a discussion and a scuffle, the Crimson Bolt gets the upper hand, has a pretty badass statement he makes, Mm -hmm. then ends up killing Jock. So, like we already said, this is the best act of the movie. Yeah. And I love anything like this uh, one man army assault here. Mm-hmm. And I also kind of love this sequence because we don't like Bolty. We do not and like she Bolty. She dies. <laughs> we are ridded of that menace, Bolty. As we were saying earlier, too, um, this is kind of a fault for the movie. Like they make it whereas he's inspired and motivated after her death yeah. to go on this rampage. Mm hmm. When obviously he doesn't really even like her. Like yeah. their characters don't really have any good relation after what we talked about earlier, mm-hmm. the way she treats him. And uh, he already had the motivation there to begin with. with yeah, Sarah. to save his wife. It's the whole point of the movie. Yeah. So um, he had a really badass statement before he stabs Jock and kills him. I can't remember what it is, but you want to touch uh, yeah, on well, that? So we talked about it a little bit earlier, but like in that montage when he's just beginning taking out all these criminals, you know, when he takes out the criminals after he's done beating them with his wrench, he like gives them a little life lesson. He's like, you know, the drug dealer's like, don't deal drugs. Don't molest children. Well, his ending speech to jock is, is a much more serious and and soulful take on that. Um, it was, it was, it was really cool. No, it, it was a good statement. And he, and like, doesn't Jacques say, like, uh, how is this going to change yeah. anything? And he said, I don't know that for sure, but I have to try yeah. or something like yeah, that. Yeah, he's like, he says, killing me, he says, do you really think killing me is going to change the world? And he's like, I can't know that for sure, but I, I'm going to try. Yeah, I really like that. It, it's uh, a perspective that I think, <laughs> this sounds dumb. But, like, there's a lot of times at work, like, I tell myself that, uh, you know, I, I I I hate coming to work and I hate doing certain things, <laughs> but I have to try. I have a house. I have a wife. I have a kid on the way. So, these are all things in life that you have to strive towards and rise, rise above. So, uh, <laughs> I know that sounds dumb, putting it on a grounded level like that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I just love that whole third third yeah. act that whole action sequence it's not like choreographed or anything really well but there's just like a lot of absurd violence yeah very brutal and they're not they're not uh what do you call them time stamps or not time stamps but title cards yeah but you get the like almost comic esque like uh the your old, blam whams kapow yeah you get your like old adam west batmans mm-hmm. on the screen it, it's it's pretty it's pretty cool um, juxtaposed with like extreme violence, like when Boldy gets shot in the face, like half her face is gone. Yeah, and like a dude gets like a pipe bomb thrown at mm-hmm. him, and like his body just blown to bits. <laughs> um, the Crimson Bolt lights a man on fire and then proceeds <laughs> to stab him to death. Also, <laughs> totally could have like Metal Gear Solided his way into the building. It was like, nope, this dude's getting burst into flames right off the bat. Gotta do what you gotta do, man. Um. So, anyways. 
He gets Sarah back, and he sadly loads up Boldy's body in the back of the SUV and leaves the home. He then takes Sarah back home, and she helps him heal. In the epilogue sequence, we see Sarah leaving Frank again, but Frank comes to terms with it, understanding that it, that his saving of her was the catalyst for Sarah returning to school, getting a degree, remarrying. So also, like I said, just the third act. Yeah, I really enjoyed the end. Gets wrapped up well, but it's just it's like it reverts back to being such a serious, heartfelt yeah. movie, mm-hmm. and I, I just can't do it with other other things. This movie like just struggles with having an identity. I think that's its biggest flaw. And sorry, I'm going to go ahead and jump in. No, I'm going to no, take, no, I'm gonna no, take, take lead. Away. I'm going to take lead here. Um, we love James Gunn. I love his humor. I love his action. I love over the top violence. His humor is always like on key. And there's like a lot of things in this movie that made me laugh. I just think that this movie didn't know specifically what it wanted to be. And if it did know what it wanted to be, it didn't know how to approach it mm-hmm. or approach it correctly. Um, as we said, the trigger scenes and also there's other things that I just don't think you can address particularly in a comedic way. Mm -hmm. If so, you're going to have to approach it differently than the way you did in this movie. I didn't like it. I didn't like the way this whole film felt. I told you like while I was upstairs watching it, the the whole movie just kind of looks like a sad, depressing yeah. small town where it just got done raining. Um, none of the none of the actors were bad in this movie. They're all good actors, but at the same time, there wasn't a single character that I was like, "That's my favorite character." Like Elliot Page did a great job, but the character of Libby sucks. Yeah, um, Frank isn't that bad of a character, but he kind of lacks in whether or not I can get behind him Mm -hmm. as a lead yeah, and as a true protagonist, which that's okay. I know we don't always need a true protagonist. Uh, The protagonist and lead in a movie can be a villainous character, but I don't think that's truly what they wanted. But there's times in the movie where it's like, this guy's deranged. Yeah. So I just had a hard time really connecting to anything here in this movie. And some of the reason that just sulks the wound is we love James Gunn. Yeah. Kind of also just drags it drags it even worse. But with that said, it's still funny. It's still got some really cool shit in it. Uh, the James Gunn isms, whereas <laughs> I know we said earlier it's a little over the top mm-hmm. and a little too heavy sometimes. There's still a lot of them that are pretty cool. So I think all in all, this might end up being my lowest rated movie that we've reviewed. I think it is. Um, with that said, it's not a terrible movie, but I'm going to give it a five out of 10. So Brett. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. I, um, sorry. I, I, um, don't have anything to say. No, I, <laughs> perfect movie. 10 out of 10. Wrap <laughs> Great it up. Movie, 10 out of 10. I, I disagree with everything week. we've said. No, but, um, I, the best way I've been describing it is I, I've been calling it kick ass but sad. <laughs> um, I think that's pretty accurate, and and it it really is. It goes back to it's got a very drab feel to it, yeah. just like with the visuals. And you know, I, I you know I like to hop in and talk about good cinematography. Mm-hmm. There's only one scene that I was like, that's really well done, yeah. And it's the um, we're behind the panel, in between the panels scene. Yeah, I, got I think that's shot super well. I think it looks really nice. That might have been the only scene that had interesting dialogue in my I opinion. I think that's my favorite scene in the movie is the in between the panels because yeah. I like the I like the message of it. I like the metaphor of being in between the panels and then it had a really good joke. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I, I just thought we should celebrate, then bake a cake. <laughs> like that was that was really good. Um yeah, I, I love this movie's broad strokes. Yeah. I love the concept. I love the story. And I, on paper, I, I love the characters. I don't have much of a, as much of a problem with Frank as you do. I think Frank was the strongest part of the movie. Um, I think I loved Rain Wilson's performance as Frank. I loved a lot of his dialogue. Uh, and then, of course, Libby's awful. But, you know, like we said, Elliot Page did a fantastic job with that performance. I, I liked the performance. I just hate the character and, yeah. and some of the writing for him. Um, I feel like there's a really good movie hiding underneath yeah. what we got. Yeah. And I think maybe, and it, it, it's weird, and I've been thinking on it, like whether or not I should say this or, or if I really feel this way, 
because you know we love our James Gunn, but I think may I, I wonder if maybe if it was written by someone else. I got you. And he just directed it. Well, it's like if you it said were a earlier. Better movie. It's like you said earlier. It's almost as if he works better when somebody is involved. Yeah. To pull back the reins yeah. a little bit. Definitely. And I think I think pretty much anybody in the world works better with a second perspective. Oh, for sure. That's that's why we why people co write things and right. we do drafts and all that. So, um. Yeah, I gave it a 6 out of 10. Okay. I give it a 6 because I do love the concept and I, I, I do really like the character of Frank and, and his art. Perfect. The I like ending's that definitely the best I part I love of his ending movie. monologue. I love the action that comes before it. Right. And I love how everything's pretty much tied up in a, in a really nice bow. Yeah. And and that that all really worked for me. It's just some of the writing choices. Yeah, the last 30 just, minutes is definitely the best part of the movie. Just a bit too much for me. Yeah. So... I, I, and you earlier I, saying it's like kick ass but sad. That's mm-hmm. a good way to put it. But that also kind of just makes me think about even more like, man, because I love kick ass. Call it nostalgia or whatever, but I can remember seeing that when it first came out. And uh, that movie knows a lot more what it wants to be. It, it's kind of the same like topic, whereas like average Joe decides, hey, fuck it. I'm going to be a superhero. Why can't I? And yeah, uh, th- that movie, though, I think. Like I said, it just knows what it wants to be a yes. little bit better. Um, I love Kick Ass. Kick Ass. So I good. would watch Kick Ass any day of the week over this. Oh yeah. Um, prob- probably my least favorite James Gunn movie that I've watched. Yeah. We didn't review. We haven't reviewed it on the show, but we um, sometimes we would like to have movie nights, and so one night Hunter showed me Slither, which is another James Gunn film. Might be my favorite James Gunn movie. <laughs> Slither was really good. Slither, Slither was great. We, we, I think you mentioned Slither a little earlier. Did I? Yeah, because you, you, you mentioned that. Well, basically, the whole cast is the same cast <laughs> yeah. in every James Gunn movie. Yeah, even the detective in this movie right. is the mayor in Slither. Right. Um, Slither, it knows what it wants to be, though. Yeah, that, I think that's what you said earlier. Maybe I did. I think you did. Oof, man. We're getting old, forgetting <laughs> stuff. But, uh, and, and you know... This this is kind of hard to compare his work with like Guardians of the Galaxy because talking about somebody there to pull back the reins. Yeah. I mean Guardians of the Galaxy, that's you know the biggest property in the world <laughs> yeah. as far as like being MCU. Mm-hmm. But his other movies, like we said, like with um, Slither and Suicide Squad, yes. even also it just has that its head in one direction yeah. for the most part. Mm-hmm. It's a superhero movie that's going to be constructed this way. Mm-hmm. Whereas this movie super, you can't even really call it a superhero movie. I know he dresses up and like kills some people, but it's, it's very hard to classify. Yeah. It's very, opinion. it's very interesting. They, they got a lot of different tones going on and none of them mesh well. And like you said, James Gunn, it's like, <laughs> some of the jokes that are made in this movie are ones that he's probably the only dude on the planet that's <laughs> laughing at. Yeah. So maybe maybe his bros, all the gun bros laugh at him. Yeah. They egg him on. So six out of ten for you? Six out of ten for me. Five out of ten for me. Lowest rated movie thus far for me, but... What else did I give a six? That is what it is. I give Indiana Jones a six. No, I thought you gave it a seven. Because I gave Indy an eight, mm-hmm. and you gave it a seven. Did I? I think you gave it a seven. Oh, you okay. did give something a six. I maybe. did though. That's what I. That's what I'm thinking. I'm not sure. I think I gave Uncharted like a six and a half or a six point seven five. I think I gave Uncharted an eight, didn't I? Well, I tell you what, I can give Uncharted. What I gave Uncharted because I documented. Oh yeah, all my you ratings. did. You, you wrote it down. Kill Bill was nine out of ten. Five Hundred Days of Summer was eight point two five out of ten. Uncharted was a six point seven five out of ten. Honestly, I might start writing down the ratings, too. I, I like that you have it all like documented. It. That's like nice. That. But uh, I try to get a little organized. I never like taking notes in school, either, though. Yeah, like, I, I, never, just, I never was, either. I just preferred taking in the information and just keeping it instead yeah. of like having to write it all down. Well, like I've said to you in the past, it's like my, my brain has reached max capacity, so every time I want to uh, remember something, I need to delete something from my yeah. <laughs> inner SD card in my head. But uh, so... Uh, I know I told you earlier what I wanted to review uh, for next, not next week, but the week prior mm-hmm. or week after, <laughs> week prior. You That's got there. Today. You got there. <laughs> um, uh, are you are you interested in that at all? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I love me some Sam Raimi. So uh, I'm I'm wanting to watch The Quick and the Dead for our next review. Uh, 1994, 95, maybe mid 90s. 
uh, Western movie that came out and uh, directed by Sam Raimi, famous for the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man trilogy and the Evil Dead trilogy. Some of that dark comedy. Oh. Uh, we're getting a trend here in some of the <laughs> yeah. things we review. This is uh, our second movie in a row, though, that neither of us have viewed prior to yeah. the podcast. So I'm what looking was forward the first to one? it. This one, super, super, and then oh, you're the saying Quick and the Dead. you're saying Quick and the Dead will be the second, right? Okay, right, yeah, right, yeah, right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm excited to branch into more of those movies that mm-hmm. neither of us have seen. Like I've never seen it, but just seeing that trailer, yeah, it looks super accessible. Because mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever watched any like the old like old westerns like a true 50s 60s no. western some of them you turn them on to put you to sleep <laughs> like some of them are rough to get through if, do you, what's the will smith movie where it's basically men in black but they're cowboys wild wild west yeah okay oh, if God, you that's... count that one I, i've seen that one too <laughs> i guess you can count that but not really i mean that's like a kid's movie basically but uh now we'll watch this and hopefully you get into it and there's a couple other accessible westerns I could suggest. Mm. If you like the Mandalorian, you could you, you could get into some westerns. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I love Cowboys. Red, Red Dead Redemption 2 is probably one of the best games I've ever played in my entire Red Dead life. 1. Red Dead Red Dead Redemption is my favorite game of all time. Mm. I, I I would I cried real actual tears of grief for Arthur Morgan. That like that's how in there I either, was. Either the first Red Dead or BioShock are probably my favorite. Those are those are one A and one B probably. But all right, so uh, Brett, one one A through one D is all four Sly Cooper games. <laughs> <laughs> Sly Cooper would probably be Sly Two Band of Thieves would be in my top ten definitely. It's not. I don't know if it's in my top five though. Uh, you want to give some shout outs here to the socials and wrap us up? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's get out of here. We got. Uh, if you want to follow us on anything, we got Twitter, which is. Real Rendezvous, at Real Rendezvous, all one thing. We got Instagram, which is at Real underscore Rendezvous underscore pod. Uh, so you can follow us there uh, for updates and all that fun jazz whenever I decide to post on there <laughs> outside of telling people when episodes come out. Uh, and then we've got uh, our YouTube, which just is another place to watch the episodes. And that is The Real Rendezvous, three separate words, uh, at YouTube.com. You know, as you were saying earlier about you just being able to retain information, every episode that you shout out our socials, I'm impressed. <laughs> so, um, yeah, like Brett said, hit us up, tell all your friends, check us out, and we will catch you guys in a couple weeks. Mm-hmm. Later. Adios. Adios.